Hi, everybody, and welcome to the first of our Pi webinars for 2021. Delighted to have so many of you with us. Do keep telling us where you're tuning in from on the chat bar, and I am delighted to introduce my panel today. Let me start with Nick, who is right next to me as I see the screen. Nick Berry is Business Development Manager, Education for Amazon Web Services. Next to him, I have Andrew Field, who is e-learning manager at Cambridge International. We have Joe Stroud, who's head of online learning for, at UCL. And last but not least, Jerry Morrison, who is director of sales and accounts for Catalyst IT Europe. So thanks for joining again. We are going to be talking about cloud-based learning systems and online education. We, I don't really know what better topic to kick off the year because everyone is continuing to stay online, pivot and work out how to deliver the best experience for students while delivering a seamless service. And also, of course, keeping the lecturers, the teachers front and center of all this evolution. So I'll just give you a few housekeeping tips and then we'll crack on. Um, we have polls. We have two polls at the bottom of your screen. Do vote on those as we go and we'll have a look at those. And we also have a question function. So you can ask a question or you can copy somebody else's question and just vote for there. So if somebody asks exactly what you'd like to our panel, just vote for that question. That will go up the hierarchy and we'll be looking at those questions shortly. First of all, let's kick off. Joey, I'd like to come to you first. Some of our panel may work with you or know you well, some of our sorry, some of our audience and some may well not. So I thought you could kick off by telling us about Catalyst, what you do and how you work with the higher education sector. Sure. Um, so Catalyst IT is a global organization um, and we're built upon um, the, the furthering or the delivery of open source based solutions. Um, We've been around for 22 years, founded in New Zealand, um, and in typical Kiwi fashion, as we've grown across the world, we've uh, beachheaded ourselves into Australia, uh, the UK and Europe, and most recently Canada. Um, in our UK operation, we are very, very focused on delivering online learning uh, or learning management systems, learning management solutions based on some very popular and probably well-known um, open source platforms. Okay, great. Generally, why does a university, which has a huge amount of resource obviously internally, but generally, why does a university choose to work with a partner such as yourselves? There's a number of reasons. Um, you know, in a nutshell, the, the key thing would be specialist expertise um, and world leading expertise in that space. Um, the platforms that we support, Moodle, Mahara, Totra, some others that many of you may have heard of, um, they are intricate and um, challenging beasts, you might say, on occasion to get the best or get the most from them. Um, it, we find that many of the partnerships we forge uh, come to us uh, originally because they're, they're kind of buried under the weight of maintenance. They're buried under the weight of operational, um, keeping the lights on uh, type tasks. Uh, it takes very, very specialist expertise to run these platforms. Um, and they're very, very difficult to find those expertise um, and, and hire them, keep hold of them uh, and maintain a, a robust and, and, and strong team that can look after these, these, these solutions. Uh, Catalyst have, you know, up, up to or approaching 400 uh, employees across our global spread. Um, and so we have, I might suggest, sort of the world leading hive mind, if you like, on how to get the most from these these products. Um, and then we, we partner with, you know, the likes of AWS and others uh, to, to ensure that they're delivering exactly on the outcomes that these institutions might see. One key thing to bear in mind is that if you forge a strong partnership like this, um, hopefully, the, you know, the, the institution can get on with delivering on those learning outcomes and those learning initiatives, whilst somebody like Catalyst uh, takes care of, of general maintenance management um, and upkeep. And are you also able to suggest ideas then in, in terms of being nimble, but seeing what other institutions are doing? Do you find that you, you can help advise as well as maintain support? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have a, a, a fleet of consultants, I might say, uh, across everything to do with e-learning. So if you have technical challenges, you have, um, you know, requirements to innovate that you need input on, we, we, we would have solutions ourselves. We can also compare and contrast on how our other partners may have solved similar problems. Um, and I might suggest that it's very rare that a very unique problem um, is presented to us. In most cases, others have had the similar challenge or, or pain previously. And we have probably delivered a solution that may be uh, fit for purpose in, in almost cookie cutter sense. Uh, but our expertise and our consultants are also, um, they, they kind of cross that line also into the, into the pedagogy and the learning space. So we have a number of 
um, consultants on our team who are able to help you uh, get the most from the platform or from the product, um, not just how to, you know, maybe integrate it, build upon it, uh, develop upon it, but also how to apply it most effectively to your to your use case, to your requirements. Okay. Joe, I'm going to come to you here because I can see you nodding, nodding along. So um, tell us a bit about your role and then your nodding. So you obviously agree that partnerships and being able to outsource are the way, is the way forward. Uh, not, nodding is a real problem of mine. It gets me picked on all of the time. It's just something that I naturally, I naturally do. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm the head of online learning at, at UCL. I work in predominantly a sort of learning design capacity. So I help staff to develop uh, online courses across programs, modules, short courses, MOOCs, all, all, all sorts of different things. Um, fundamentally, I'm nodding because, yeah, you know, I, I, I do agree with Joey. I, I don't think that partnerships between um, higher education institutions in particular and, uh, and private sector organisations always go that well. Um, the organisations can be quite different beasts, but I think that some of the points that, that Joey has made in about specifically this space and the skill set that's required to get the most out of the platforms that universities very commonly use are all are really, really accurate. You know, I've, I've worked at a number of universities already and building a team with that specialist skill set and keeping hold of them is a really difficult thing to do. Um, and so it's 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 not necessarily about the, the sort of technologies and the platforms in this instance, but this group of people who have come together um, and know a lot about how to make those platforms um, work. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a you know been always been a positive opportunity for us to work with companies like Catalyst. Mm. I guess more than ever that the expertise is at a premium, right, in how to deliver and develop. Uh, so, so certainly this year, you know, roles like mine have been exceptionally um, in, in demand, but we've had to make decisions very, very quickly. Um, and again, like Joey has said, bringing, bringing people, bringing that skill set together in such, such a short uh, period of time would not have been possible. Um, UCL has got two distinct um, learning platforms. So we have an internal Moodle instance that we use for all of our credit bearing uh, programs and modules. That's always been hosted on prem, on prem, on premises. Um, and we also have a, a sort of public facing Moodle environment that's been um, uh, hosted with with Catalyst for about eighteen months um, at, at this stage. The, the situation that we found ourselves in this year was an impossible one. There's absolutely no way that we could have taught online this year with our existing on-prem um, setup. We knew that we had to move to the cloud. We knew that we had to do it really, really quickly. And we knew that we couldn't do that ourselves. So, you know, we found ourselves in a very difficult place. We, we, we had to partner fundamentally, but I don't think that that in itself has, has been a negative experience in, in any way. It's taught us a lot about what we would need to do longer term to, to keep these kinds of things going. And can you give me an example? You see, as a big institution, can you give me an example of the size of the cohort you were taking online? Um, uh, in the previous academic year, so the 2019-20 academic year, we had about 43,000 students. That's big for a UK university, but due to some um, issues uh, caused by government, we have got um, we have a cohort of 48,000 students this year. You don't normally make big jumps like that. 48,000 students is a, is, a, is a very, very large UK university. And I think Joey will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've now got the UK's largest Moodle instance, like bigger than the OUs, which was unthinkable to me. When I heard that in a meeting about three or four months ago, I said, uh, are you sure? Um, <laughs> I'm told that that is correct. So it's, it's, it's quite a big deal. And just to perspective, um, last year that site was receiving roughly sort of 700,000 page views a day and uh, since COVID it's or since the new semester new year is 1.5 million page views per day um, so it's it's a hundred percent increase um, yeah. overnight and, and you know you could not do that without ultimately moving to the cloud. No. 
And another quick question, Joe, and then we'll uh, let somebody else speak too. But why did you decide to move with Catalyst? I mean, what help? it's a big decision, right? Who you work with? Just wondering what made you decide. We, we, we've got these two different platforms. We have a pre-existing um, relationship with 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 Catalyst. Um, I've had arm's length experience of Catalyst for quite a long time. At this point, I've, I've implicitly been involved in development projects for you know plugins and things like that. So. You know, there's 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 a history there, um, but we still went through a standard procurement process. We have to do that as a you know as a university, as a as a you know public sector organisation. Ultimately, you know, our, our existing contract with with Catalyst is quite a small one. The, the 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 extend platform that we have is 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 nothing compared to what we have um, for internal Moodle. But again. Catalyst approached the conversations that we had in a very flexible way. We've actually got two very different hosting arrangements in place for UCL Extend versus UCL Moodle. But they listened to what it is that we needed to get out of the situation. And I think we're, we're very flexible in, in meeting those requirements. And, you know, even though we're, we're you know, we're, we're currently signed up to work together for a, a set period of time, I don't think that they were, you know, trying to not necessarily trap, but you know, keep us working with them for a really long time. It was about solving the problem that was in front of us, and I think we really appreciate that. Okay, great. <laughs> Joey, that actually makes me <laughs> sorry. Did you hear that weird noise? Um, cloud hosting. I'm going to bring Nick in to talk about cloud hosting. But from your perspective, working with the unis closely, is this the big? Has this been a big move in the last twelve months, or were or were institutions thinking about? going into the cloud anyway um <clears throat> there's always a, a, an interesting line that nobody makes a decision unless there's a pain to solve um and i'd say that we do experience that in the higher ed space some things can move very slow people make a lot of conversations there's a lot of ideas discussed and then things will just tail off because you know delivering education gets in the way and another year will flip by um it is definitely the case that as march and april bit this year um and honestly, people's on-premise systems fell over or became very, very close to falling over. That pain, that impetus, that kick up the backside, you might say, was um, was front and centre. Um, and the thing that, I, you know, just to add to Joe's point, Catalyst has got a ready-made solution for these platforms. We've been refining it from one partnership to the next. It's It's captured in code. We can spin it up very quickly. And we can prove in advance and, and, and in, a, in a tendering process that it will work and it will meet the demand. And so, um, yes, it's been a, a year of urgency being increased. Um, but I don't think that these discussions weren't already in train. They were just slowly moving along. I think we might have lost Amy there. Oh, no. <clears throat> Sorry, oh, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying before we went live that my internet had dropped. Anyway, I'm back. Yes. Sorry, what did I miss? Uh, just to say that, yeah, you know, it has pushed along, pushed along these decisions a bit faster. Um, certainly, since since the urgency was dialed up to eleven. Okay. Well, Nick, this is a timely point to bring you in. Um, Interested to know how many partners you have in the education space in the UK, for example, and why they would choose to come and work with you. Hi. So, hi everyone. Um, yeah. So, well, globally, we've got we've got probably more than ten thousand education customers uh, that are using AWS, um, which includes HE institutions and, and research, academic research, um, ed techs, and technology partners who are powering education, which is indeed some of the the commercial VLEs out there, um, as well as publishers, Cambridge Assessment, um, schools and colleges. So there's hundreds of millions of students, educators, researchers in over 200 countries and, and territories that have got access to, to education technologies and online curriculum running on AWS, either natively or, 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 or um, you know, through a, through a technology partner. So in terms of the UK, we're working with the majority if not all of the of the UK universities, and to to the points raised already by by Joe and and Joey, um, you know, we've seen a big move towards um, 
hosting workloads, in, in, including Moodle and, and other VLEs this year, um, in order to provide cost saving, but allow them to focus on, I think a point Joey made, focus on resources and, and working closer with faculty on student needs so we can take away that undifferentiated heavy lifting, as we call it. So, but yeah, I mean, this has been happening for, for, for a decade or so for us, um, but there's certainly been a big acceleration um, since March. And how do you work in terms of the way you price? Is it based on user per day or? I mean, wow, that's a big, that's a big, uh, a big topic. Yeah, I mean, I'm just interested if the institution is thinking, how does it scale? Into, how flexible are you, I guess, around that sort of hosting? Yeah, sure. Let me see if I can answer your question. But <clears throat> I think, you know, if you're looking at probably the key reason that, that people move to cloud so quickly, cost and the pricing model is, is probably number one. Um, so with cloud, you don't have to lay out the capital up front for servers and to, to Joe's point about moving quickly, you know, that, that can take months mm -hmm. to, to get, to, to do a procurement, get the equipment, um, you know, get your infrastructure and so on. So, so that ability to um, not have that capital outlet for, and, and, you know, data centers and so on. Um, instead you get to pay as you consume and it's a variable expense. So, um, you know, what, what, what we're trying to help um, customers do is, you can provision for, um, you, you know, you don't have to provision for a peak. You can just use what you need when you need it. And then if you don't need it, you can stop paying us and give it back. And, and we have, you know, a large number of services um, which can be priced by the second or by the minute, uh, they, they differ. Uh, but that variable expense is is generally very much lower than what, what, you, what virtually any company could do on its own because of the scale that AWS can pass on. Um, and we've lowered prices, for instance, 85 times since AWS launched in, in 2006. So I think I think there's that element of cost being a very attractive factor. But the other key reason that, that I think in, institutions are moving is, is that agility and speed that, that cloud offers, which we've just touched on. So, you know, which allows them to change or um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? But yeah, change that student yeah, yeah, customer yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, also, I'm interested in the way you work with a partner like Catalyst. This webinar is around sort of power of partnership. Do you do you prefer to work with a client who also has someone like Catalyst in the loop? Or do you think it's more impactful for the institution? Yeah, absolutely. So so AWS is all about long term partnership, long term thinking. And and that strong belief, you know, can only be delivered for customers uh, with our partner network and, and partners such as Catalyst. They're critical to helping us do that. So I think that model, and I think Joe touched on it earlier, it provides customers with the best of best of both worlds. So you've got the combining the support of AWS services, the technical resources and the subject matter experts uh, that we can that we can provide with a with um, with consultant servicing partners such as such as Catalyst, who can assist with planning, migration, deployment, and that management and support ongoing. So I think you know we work very well, and our model is very much about a partner-enabled model. And and as I say, that's that's consulting partners such as such as Catalyst, but also with those technology partners that we want to power education through and ensure that their platforms and their systems are moving forward and innovating at, at the fastest possible tick. So, so yeah, we've, we've, we've got um, tens of thousands of partners globally and, and, and that creates a really large dynamic community. And I think that helps, um, you know, you've got pretty much use cases for everything as I think Joey touched on. So, so we can share that knowledge and there's that collaboration and feedback between customers where we can help them see the art of the possible and, and, and talk to people who have already done done that work that's interesting i was actually just having a look at the polls then as well and um interesting that 28 percent of people who voted are re-evaluating platforms being used i guess this is well again these sort of partnership approaches can all help inform um joe i was going to ask you quickly i meant to ask you earlier and then we will come to you andrew but what platforms are you using at ucl i imagine it's a sort of combination of various 
Uh, again, about 100% more than we were using last year. There's just tools popping up all over the place. Um, we're, we're predominantly a, a Moodle institution, and then we use stuff like uh, Panitin and Echo 360, Office 365, and lots of other, like just a, a really big suite of much smaller tools that are targeted towards specific disciplinary context. Okay, great. Andrew, thanks for being patient. Love to bring you in. I know you have a really interesting role and a sort of great lens onto what educators are doing in very, very many countries. So maybe you could explain a little bit about your role first. Yeah, sure, of course. So um, I'm e-learning manager at Cambridge International, which is part of the university's assessment group. Um, and my main focus is on helping teachers make effective use of technology for teaching and learning. Um, and my work began sort of with our, a course called Global Perspectives that we run. It was making use of an open source portal. And what was absolutely vital was that these sort of things could scale. And the current hosting we had wasn't awesome, but it did its job. And I was looking around for um, other ways that we can support teachers and learners. So the, the key thing with that is actually enabling them not even to talk about the technology. The conversations we've been able to have because of the partnerships we've got have been about how can we teach lessons more effectively? How can we support learners in really challenging situations? How can we support teachers' workload? It hasn't been about, oh no, that server's crashed or this doesn't work or I can't log in. And once that conversation changes to focus on learning, you know already things are being positive. And that's been my, my main focus. Joe keeps nodding again, by the way. <laughs> Well, Joey, let, let's talk about Joey and Catalyst. Um, I, I was looking for a robust solution that could cope with demand. And I got in contact with Catalyst and Joey even answered the phone. And within a couple of sentences, he gave me a robust solution that we actually employ and we continue to employ. Um, at the time, I wanted to transition some existing Moodles and Maharas to a sort of one platform. And we were able to do that. And it was sort of 2016 going into 2017. Um, and that work continues to provide a cloud-based provision. Catalyst are the external third-party support and do all the heavy lifting and all the, the awesome work behind the scenes. AWS servers that Cambridge Assessment control and pay for are, are fantastic. And again, I bore people talking about AWS, but teachers don't care about AWS. They want to know that their worksheet's available or their online tool is working or the Moodle's keeping going. And that's why this has worked absolutely so well. Um, and as a sort of a brief example, we, we have a, a, an item called Resource Plus, which is a subscription product where we've created um, a, a range of materials. It's all based on Moodle, but no one knows it's Moodle because we just make it work. But um, this had about 2,000 users um, were active. Sort of end of February 2020, we had 2,000 users. We took the decision to open it up to all of our schools. And by the end of March 2020, it had 90,000 users in a week. So the, the scale of that, and because it's based on AWS, because it was this robust solution that Catalyst have supported us with, it just worked. And that has to be the solution that we're talking about. Now, we could spend hours talking about all the technology and all the great stuff that all these providers do. But if a teacher can use technology without worrying about it, immediately things get better. You develop that confidence, you develop that willingness to try things, willingness to say, well, actually, I don't need to do deliver a live lesson here. I could do something a bit different. And it's that confidence which I'm so interested in. Um, and sort of colleagues get fed up with me saying this, but every single teacher needs to ask, well, what difference has it really made? Where's the value in that technology? And it isn't about actually live lessons or being told to do remote instruction it's about supporting teacher learners in the very best way at this difficult time and if they can rely on a moodle site or a mahara site and to, to be honest most teachers and around the world end up calling it moodle as sort of almost almost like a swear word because they go oh that moodle's crashed again or something's gone wrong but what we're seeing is where you have these strong partnerships set up where you can scale things sort of exponentially people start to trust the technology and covid is clearly an awful terrible time but some of the findings we're at we're finding we're, we're discovering in this awful challenging time is that this technology can deliver but this is where teachers and learners are really asking some challenging questions we, we've had sort of um materials which we, we expected to be downloaded twenty thousand times um, and just like factors of 10, factors of 100 of people just using these things. So um, it, it's about 
delivering for our teachers that, that's been vital and can you talk about where people are down are they all coming from all over the world I and mean, where are your users coming from can you give us a bit more of a scope oh yeah sure so so Cambridge International supports over 10,000 schools across over 110 countries so and um, there's my sort of spiel line that I'm often told to, to wheel out there but genuinely these are these uh, schools all around the world and every school is different just as a good teacher knows every single learner is different you have to be able to provide solutions to support them um, mm -hmm. across our schools around the world we've seen obviously a growth in video based content we've obviously we've not obviously, we've also seen a range of tools being used so right at the start of the pandemic we put together uh, with our support from schools in china a whole range of suggestions of things they might like to consider and it's not about saying you must do this you should do this for high quality for remote instruction it's instead about laying open a range of tools and opportunities for teachers and uh, learners to use and that's where you can add the real value for education so um i i hesitate to say that schools in a certain area have, have done a certain thing it's mm -hmm. about allowing teachers to deliver really effective lessons um and a great lesson is one that engages learners at the start you've got an activity where learners get busy there's then a reflection activity you then have another activity to get learners engaged and enjoying their learning and then you reflect again at the end to see what everyone's learned and what progress has been made that doesn't happen if your teacher is talking over a powerpoint for 60 minutes and if a teacher has to do that five times a day that just workload just isn't feasible at all and what what we can do is help teachers to be more confident to maybe record a little starter activity that gets played to the learner whenever that's good for the learner to use and and engaging in sort of project based activities that can be asynchronous you do at any time you like and it allows learners to make the best use of this technology so it's not about substituting what previously went on maybe in a more traditional classroom it's about doing things differently in spite of everything that's going on and just a little question, which is going to be hard, and I this is a curveball, so I didn't tell you I would ask you this, but I'm just interested. Andrew, you have a scope on schools all over the world. Joe, you're coming from a higher education institution background. Have either sector found it easier than the other? I mean, do you think it's been the big pain point? And I guess, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm asking you to speak for the whole sector, and I know that's hard, but I just sort of wonder whether you feel like either sector has turned a corner in terms of really understanding how to bring teachers on the tech journey which they've had to make i could say something really briefly about well-being because that's where it's got to be um mm -hmm. teachers school managers people who own chains of schools governments um it only takes a couple of sentences for someone to say you must do this the moment you tell a teacher you must do something you've already gone down the wrong line it's about supporting teaching in the best possible way where we've seen some great examples is where teachers have been allowed to make their own choices about technology and the best way to deliver things and there's so many good examples of teachers not just thinking we must do this because it's technology it's about giving teachers that confidence to see well what worked really well in the classroom now might work really well in a different setting and I think we've seen a whole plethora of discoveries all around the world where teachers have realised a good teacher is a good teacher. And it's that teacher who doesn't say you must do less, uh, the first five tasks in the first 10 seconds. It's someone who goes, how is everyone today? How are we doing? And a real emotional understanding that this is a really tricky time. So I, I'm not sure we're anywhere close to talking about anything related to pandemic successes at the moment we're talking about people surviving but making best use of all these technology all this technology that's available great joe i'd love to hear your thoughts too as head of online learning um <laughs> for the um, 43 45 000 students and i don't know uh, looking after them all but you are head of online learning at ucl so you would have a sort of interesting lens on how the teaching profession has managed on the pivot it's um i mean it's 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 quite tough to answer i think if we're talking about he versus uh you know school level education i'm 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 pretty sure the people teaching primary school kids and secondary school kids have had a harder job over overall and fundamentally that's because they're teaching people who don't yet know how to learn um we obviously have a um, a, a, a spectrum of experience in universities and I, you know I, I, I think from a different perspective on well-being 
we feel really bad for 18 year olds who have come through a you know a period of massive disruption uh, uh, disruption straight through to university which is a very very different kind of environment and having to do you know all of all of that online it's really really tough for them um in terms of how our staff have coped you know the 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 community at UCL is extremely diverse, it is exceptionally capable, um, and staff have put an extraordinary amount of effort into making things work this year. Um, I think Andy makes some, um, some, some really, really good points. A lot of our staff have absolutely been surviving through it, but we've had others who have, who have thrived as well, and, and in disciplines that wouldn't previously have even considered uh, offering their courses fully online there have um, there, there have been many members of staff in, in in that pot who have come back to me and said you know what I'm going to do things quite differently in future because bits of this I'm not keen on and bits of it have worked for me in a way that I yeah I, a way that I couldn't really have imagined and I think that although you know UCL will continue to be uh, a, a university that is quite focused on its on-campus provision we will do a lot more genuinely blended learning in future. I think we will have um, a, 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 a portfolio of fully online programs that, that grows far more quickly than it than it would have done if we didn't have the pandemic. But even those courses that, that remain formally on campus will blend a lot better. Um, I think we will probably see specific teaching methods um translated to uh to, to online delivery more quickly as well you know lots of people have got their eye on lectures and very large group teaching anything that's really didactic why do we need to gather hundreds of people in the, in the same place to to do that and that's not to say that that will be a uniform approach across disciplines either you know we've got a lot of uh practice-based subjects at ucl that i have never touched in terms of planned for online learning because i can't help them you know if somebody needs to be in a lab we simply don't have the technologies to be able to, to to do those things successfully yet they will go back on campus but there'll be other parts of those courses um that fundamentally change because of the experiences that people have had this year and the date the level of data tracking we think that's i agree with you i think everyone's thinking that some sort of hybrid is here to stay but also the sort of power of the data around how people interact online yeah 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 definitely again it's 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 always something that we've we've been thinking about in this quite slow way prior to, prior to this year it's um collecting data and interpreting it is obviously quite a contentious issue in the university environment mm -hmm. and it's um it is one that we will take a little bit of a step back from to think about how we can use that data successfully but also sensitively and ethically um but there are lots of opportunities there you know i, I don't think that people in our kinds of positions will ever be wanting for work from this point onwards there's going to be plenty for us to do yeah and, and just to, yeah, just, to, okay. just to say the thing about um data and tracking and privacy um it's about tracking use not tracking users and that's so important because um we need to have upfront discussions about use and whose data is being stored and everything like that and those discussions have also been driven forward now and we can talk about how many users we've had and that the great impact and power that's had but it's not about tracking individuals um it's now about learning all about um surveillance capitalism and actually making sure that large institutions deliver on that and provide the confidence and that's again what good partnerships can do sort of ourselves discussing here but through everything that Pi does and everything beyond that so it's 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 having those robust discussions and that's where we as educators and technology experts can can actually really talk about these things now and remember what happened during 2020 well this is what we have to do for the next 10 years and it, it I, that that's a, a huge positive i hope I th yeah, yeah. i just add amy that yeah in, in our conversations particularly with with executive teams at universities data is where we always land we always end up with a conversation that's about and and, the, and to andrew's point you know there's there's challenges around that um but that is the number one conversation that we're having with universities around how they can better utilize data for student experience student retention um 
providing ultimately yeah a better better service to the to the customer and and using cloud and machine learning and ai tools is 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 yeah pr mm -hmm. probably the hottest topic we see at the moment in in, in he i think there's yeah. to that as well if i might just finalize on that data point um you have to be we're starting to now become aware of the value uh, to others of the data that we generate and capture um and you know with a good robust partnership um which Ultimately, if, if delivered correctly, you may host on AWS, Catalyst might look after your platforms uh, or some other arrangement. But in those kinds of partnerships, your data remains yours um, and you are not ultimately uh, releasing it or giving it away. Um, you are in full control of it at all times. If you then decide that you want to take insight from that data, well, then brilliant. And there's a ton of tools and a ton of approaches emerging to, to deliver on that insight. But... Um, we are definitely becoming more aware of the value um, of the data that we capture uh, for our own for our own purposes, but uh, more possibly, you know, concerningly to others, um, which is certainly a big topic as we at this time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I what we've certainly had here at the Pi in terms of we obviously talk a lot about general education trends, but international students and how they fit into the big education piece and. We have been hearing anecdotally, not led by data, but anecdotally, some nationalities are really engaging and uh, thriving online, whether in situations where they might have felt shy to ask questions or raise their hands. I think there's also some interesting data which could be used in terms of how students choose to interact, and some of them prefer to interact online rather than in a big, you know, lecture hall surrounded by people who where they feel nervous about their use of a second language. So there's another really interesting lens on that there. Yeah, well, just to say with that, high quality design materials, which have all accessibility arrangements right from the start, that makes courses and materials better for everybody. So it's an absolute no brainer for anyone designing anything online now. That conversation should never be having, oh, should we have subtitles on that? Or do we need to check this for reading level and things like that? Um, it it's, it's, has to be much more um, higher end intelligent discussions about that now. Um, we've absolutely seen during the pandemic where some learners have found working at home or working in different environments with additional tools available to them makes a huge difference. E even just minor things like auto captioning. Um, a year or so ago, it produced a comedy thing every time you saw the auto captions. But now those tools are actually have actually grown up and are working particularly well. So it, it, it's a great point you make about um, we're enabling better student interaction now but it, it's got to be an absolute expectation. And the part of this I absolutely love is now people have had a taste of what good looks like. Nothing less than that is acceptable anymore. So the bar of quality has to continue to rise. And that's again, back to these partnerships. So with technical stuff, we can get support from Catalyst and how to scale these things. With the AWS hosting, we can know we've got elasticity built in. Obviously you've got to pay a lot more when it does go fully elastic and get stretched, but all of these things come into it. So. Um, I, I think now we have to get from these these awful times. What are the positive learnings, and what what's the real impact that, that these things have made? Absolutely. A quick question to you, Joey. Well, two questions. Any other trends you think the audience would really be interested in in terms of how learning you're seeing different institutions approach the way they deliver synchronous, asynchronous? You know how, how they're sort of planning the learning design. And yeah. then secondly, a quick one about um, why you choose to work with AWS as well. Yeah, so th this actually follows on from the point <clears throat> you asked Joe around, you know, or Joe and Andrew, did did these two sort of um, focuses into the sector at various levels um, succeed better? I would say from our perspective, no, but we are seeing some institutions succeed significantly better than others. Um, UCL were reasonably well prepared as, as much as can be because they'd already taken that asynchronous approach to a number of their um, learning events or learning initiatives. Uh, it doesn't mean that the teaching staff and, the, and all of the staff at UCL haven't had a, a huge job on their hands, but we've seen other university clients or other large educators who um, have just tried to recreate the classroom experience online. And so they have effectively started sessions with giant video conferencing calls that kick off at 9 a.m. and you've got 200 people trying to connect to watch a student, a, 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 a teaching member of staff in their lounge, you know, with a whiteboard knocked up. Um, 
And that just does not work. It fundamentally will not work and it does not work. And so a lot of them went through a pretty big, um, I might say a shock factor to kind of realize that that was not going to be um, successful and you know, are now rapidly coming up to speed with the idea of asynchronous, self-led online learning. Um, Catalyst does have a team of um, learning techs, people that we have taken from the university space to help with that stuff. Um, but yeah, absolutely, you know, we are seeing variants uh, from one to the next about how successfully they're pulling this off. Um, and we've seen some very, very, um, I won't say bad, but unconsidered sort of approaches first off that just didn't work and they've had to rapidly adapt. Um, but we're getting there now. And as, as we mentioned earlier, you know, we can share across this, this space um, the successes that are working elsewhere, which is really good. Great. Um, why did we pick AWS? Um, I mean, you know, first and foremost, we were led by the requirements that we had at the time. We've been AWS partners for approaching 10 years. Um, there are other vendors, out, other options out there, but for us, um, AWS were significantly ahead, significantly more mature at the time that we really started to, to offer these, these cloud-based solutions. Um, and also, I mentioned earlier about the level of expertise. We, we, we really do have some of the world leaders in what we do within our organization um, and they need access visibility and observability upon the technology stack um, we don't find that anything is hidden opaque or obfuscated from us when we're working at the, at the technology level we're able to get in um, analyze and interrogate um, you know issues arising elements that might need some attention uh, and solve them ourselves um, and without naming any other, you know, competitor um, offerings, there have been some occasions in those others where we've maybe been sat on a, on a call on hold uh, waiting for an engineer at, at that end to tell us something that we know we just can't see it. Um, whereas with AWS, we have uh, exceptional power and control at our fingertips. And so that has served us really, really well. Okay, great. Uh, stay in the hot seat because I'm going to go to questions now. And our most popular question from John Chisholm is, uh, I'll just click start answering. So we can, if you're watching this remotely on replay, you can just click to the answers. Do you envisage that demand for cloud-based learning systems are here to stay? Or will this plateau once COVID-19 is less of an issue? Alternatively, do you think that COVID-19 will simply accelerate a trend and that cloud-based learning systems are here to stay and grow? Um, if I was to, if I was asked to write a business case between on-premise or cloud-based hosting, I could not write one for on-premise. Honestly, I don't really understand um, how in the future, you know, Nick hit the nail on the head. The scale of say, the scale of of, of technology that they are ultimately procuring and the scale of services that they have set up means that those savings can be passed on exceptionally well to to the users of the AWS um, products and services. Um, but beyond that, the spiky nature and the behavior of traffic on websites nowadays, you know, you must have enough resources provisioned at all time for your busiest period of the day or year. And every other moment that you're not using that 100% capacity, you are effectively wasting that resource. With AWS uh, or, you know, or with cloud, um, you, you know, you can get a very, very accurate trend line between your spend and the performance requirement you have. And if you fall short, you can turn it up in seconds. Um, you cannot procure new physical hardware from a vendor, often on the other side of the world, in less than weeks or months in most cases. So it, 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 I can't see why um, it, any other option would be considered into the future. Okay. Yeah, I, I think if I can add to that, Amy, yeah. if that's all right. Um, yeah, our, our global edu team, and, and I've done a lot of research actually this last year, um, second half of last year to, um, oh, I've lost the question. Where's it gone? Um, Sorry, it's, it's now in answer, but you can, you can click oh, Okay, the there we now. go. Um, so to your second point, John, I think um, absolutely COVID-19 accelerated a trend, which, you know, we were seeing people move, particularly in, in education, but all sectors to cloud and uh, for 10 years. But, um, it's, it's, you know, one of my quotes that I've probably not not mentioned is um, that, you know, all the feedback from customers says they've done things in weeks that would have took years to, to the point made earlier around how, how that's, um, it's just been accelerated because of a need. Um, 
all the research we've done, and we've got a, a report that I can share if, if Amy's okay with that, um, an ebook that we've done around sort of the new model of, of learning and cloud, uh, says that, yeah, th this is here to stay. We don't envisage the world going back to exactly what it was. Um, we believe that, you know, cloud-based learning systems and, and remote learning and online learning will be an integral part of, of whatever the new normal looks like as, as we hopefully come out of this in, in the coming months. So, so yeah, and we, we like I said, we've got we've got some research that we can share and an ebook that, that you can uh, you can have a look at. And I just have seen a question pop in at the bottom, um, but I'm going to ask it from Chris Bunyan. He's like, is there provision for small independent companies with smaller budgets, or do you deal exclusively with larger organisations? And I'm aware that UCL and Cambridge International are large, but if there was a smaller operation who wanted to move cloud-based, what would, what would you say that, to them? That's yeah. where it is. But, yeah. but yeah, hundred percent, Chris. And you know, we work with the very smallest ed techs, and you know, startups is a huge part of our business, actually. And um, I suppose some of the big ones that are huge now, but we're tiny. You know, Netflix and Uber and all these others that, um, that we could name. But um, yeah, so so absolutely, and we have a lot of support and programs specifically in place for for small to medium enterprises and, and smaller organisations. Were you going to say something, Joey? I think so. Yeah, I was just saying yeah. that we offer a range of well, you know partnership models. The model we have with UCL is um, it's UCL's uh, AWS infrastructure, it's UCL's platform, it's UCL's uh, product. Top of what I'm saying with Cambridge Assessment, but we just manage it on their behalf. So we apply our expertise to make their world um, painless, seamless, uh, and, and simple. We run our own AWS cluster that if you are smaller and you don't require you know, a fully dedicated private and privately man owned uh, cloud account, then you can, you can host with Catalyst um, on AWS still. All the benefits of scalable, uh, rapidly um, you know, scalable uh, solution, um, but in a much simpler um, and, and much cheaper, I might say, you know, um, model. Great. Yeah, no, I, was, I was just gonna add really quickly, um, with things like Moodle, that's the beauty of open source as well. You go on Moodle's website, you use the Moodle cloud to try things out to see because it allows you to prove your great ideas. It's quite often you've got some teachers or lecturers who've got a brilliant idea, but it's difficult to articulate or to articulate even. A bit odd I said that word wrong, never mind. Um, you, what you do with these things is you actually build it. You develop the thing and you show, look, here's what it actually is. Because so often people go, oh, well, I can't see how that would work. Well, you click your fingers and you show them how it would work. And then you talk to people like Joey and others to, to say, well, we have a need for this number of users at the moment. But what do we do when it scales? And it allows you to have those robust discussions, not about um, technology and failing, talking about teaching and learning and scalability and maintenance and how we can make these things happen. So cloud well, it's not even a discussion to have. Cloud is the way to do it because it allows people to, to scale whatever's going on in the world. Good. I am going to do one more. I've got a few interesting questions around more around learning design too, but one more. There's a few more questions about cloud. So I'm just going to ask one which has got a few votes, which is Are there any downsides to cloud hosting in terms of privacy? And then there was another question below that, which is essentially saying, Is what about corporate failure? So I guess, are there any downsides? The first answer I would give is that um, there's a lot of myth and misconception and, and misunderstanding about you know what the cloud is. Um, it's become a term that is rather woolly and vague in many cases. Um, the simple answer is no, I don't believe there is. Um, we would suggest that if you're not following strong safety, security uh, and, and good practice principles, you, you are significantly at risk when you're putting your data anywhere but when you work with a cloud provider like AWS and a solid partner like Catalyst, you know, who have um, all of the security uh, certifications in place that, that demonstrate best practices being applied, um, then, you know, it is, is absolutely as robust and secure, if not significantly more so than, than you know, ultimately having a server in your cupboard or, or a server under your stairs that, that potentially humans can get to. Just to put this in perspective, um, no engineer at AWS is able to see into the machines that we are running on our behalf um, in, in what's called a virtual private cloud. There is no engineer who can walk into a data center and get to any of the data that we are storing. It's just not possible. Um, the only people who are able to uh, 
uh, see, access, and, and, and ultimately interact with the machines and the servers and the data that we have there are us. And I've got another question just about the biggest risk, I guess, for an institution is sort of cyber security and being hacked, right? I mean, and I've heard a few rumors around institutions not being able to access some of the learning resources which are on-prem. I mean, which, which option is more cyber secure? Is it? Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, question. The biggest attack vector is the human component of your operation. The biggest risk angle always is that a human uh, accidentally uh, conveys a password or gives gives up some kind of access or, or goes rogue. Um, the, the systems themselves and the encryptions that are in place from end to end, from the user's browser to the servers and back again, are unbreakable. Um, and they are, you know, to be honest, basic internet uh, sort of standards these days. Um, everything that you would expect is in place to protect against those um, hiccups or accidents that may be uh, delivered by a human, two-factor authentication, all of these kind of elements that ensure that um, even if a person accidentally gives up uh, useful information to maybe reset a password, they're still unable to access those accounts because we've got you know robust two-factor authentications in place. Okay, good. Thank you. Let's move on to some of these interesting questions around um, the learning design as well. Um, which one do I pick? Uh, well, I guess the most popular is how should institutions help their teaching staff navigate the journey to online teacher? Uh, Andy, you did say some important things, I think, around emotional support of teachers and allowing them to experiment. Yeah, so with that, it's about being confident to allow teachers to do things differently, but also helping those teachers who are most worried. So things like paired teaching, where you might have traditionally taught 30 students in a classroom with one teacher, get your teachers together, support each other, have your teacher champions, just as you would in a traditional school where you've got someone who's enthusiastic about something they want to deliver, do the same with digital. So run larger sessions with three classes together and three teachers and support each other. Um, and always, always the most reticent teacher, the teacher who thinks they've got the least to offer for technology, has the absolute most to offer because they're always the teacher who say, so what? I'll appear enthusiastic and go, oh, how amazing is cloud based learning and you do all this stuff, all these amazing tools. And someone says, so what? It just makes you stop and go, well, actually, it does make a real difference because of these ideas, these ways of making materials more accessible, these ways of allowing people to access it when they need it, not when you tell them they need it. So it's about well-being and support, and it's about allowing teachers to fail with the technology because you start thinking about these things. Well, what do I do if my video doesn't quite work? And it's not a disaster. The learners are there to support and help. It actually changes the dynamic with a lot of these things. So many learners around the world, they don't wanna see their teachers fail or, or something not working either. They actually want to support each other. And that changes the dynamic as well. Um, just one of the brief things, sort of some of the things we, we've done loads of. Um, mm -hmm. Traditionally, we often have meetings in rooms with a few people joining us over video. What we now get is everyone over video and that levels the playing field. And similar with lessons. Um, with, with the right approaches and the fact that everyone's in this together, we're all supporting each other, giving teachers some suggestions, some ideas, but allowing them the time to discover these things and actually realising that through technology, you can make it easier for teachers. So there's less work, there's less planning, there's fewer things to mark because you can use formative feedback, all of these different things. That's what I'd say. Great. Joe, what would you say? I'm sorry, you... um... oh, sorry yeah. I think I, I think those are, are, are all excellent points. I think in, in specific reference to the pandemic, I think one of the most important thing that we did for our staff is we gave them agency. Um, we had you know a, a, a really strong um, staff development offering available quite early on because we had as an institution been decisive about what it is that we were going to do. But that program enabled people to meet, you know, a, a baseline for what it is that they uh, needed to do in quite a short space of time. And beyond that, we enabled them to go in the direction that they wanted to. Again, a, a, an institution like UCL that is very multidisciplinary, no central resource is ever going to be able to teach everybody everywhere how it is that they need to approach their subject. And so departments needed to you know, forge that path on their own. 
Um, there's a comment to this question as well that I that I do think is 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 very relevant. The material and the support that we designed for staff in the last year was designed in such a way that was cognizant of the amount of time that people had in front of them, i.e. not enough. Um, and the message that we really hammered home to staff was, you know, wherever it is that you feel that you get to this year, you're going to have put quite a lot of effort into it. You will not have had anywhere near as much time as you needed to get it right. So, you know, don't, don't worry about it. As long as you've done your best, that, that's okay. And you've got something to build on for, for the future. And Joe, while you're there, there was one question directed at you. Where was it? Oh, yes, which was just um, tremendous, tremendous levels of positivity. Are there any pitfalls or challenges UCL has faced with its move to cloud-based hosting? Um, cloud-based hosting that's specifically? Yes. Yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at it. I, I, um, I, I mean, I don't think so. Confidence in our platforms is at, is at an all time high. You know, we've, we've never had loads of problems, um, but you know, yeah, p people, people trust and they're confident that things are going to work when they, when they want them to work. And, you know, going back to the question earlier, it would be pretty regressive for us to go back to an on-prem solution after we've after we've got now you know what joey says about being able to write a business case for an on-premises solution i don't know what you put in that it's, it's, it's there's, there's no argument to be to be made for it um andrew said something some really good things earlier we don't want our staff to think about the hosting of our services we don't want them to know anything about it if they don't want to know about it and um, yeah cloud okay i'm going to try and squeeze in two more that. questions so quick one now to Janice Richards, this may well be for you, Andrew and Joe as well, but it's, are there any suggestions on how to better support students who are only able to access online learning systems via smartphone and for whom the cost of data may be a barrier? Um, I'll, I'll jump in quickly. This, this, is, this is one of the reasons why we, we, we did promote uh, asynchronous um, learning design. It, that, it, it, it wasn't mandated. But fundamentally, we, um, we we argued for it in terms of uh, equity on the student side and, you know, really the staff side. Again, we've got so many teaching staff. Not everybody is a, um, you know, a, a, a professor sitting in North London somewhere. We've got a lot of graduate teaching assistants who, you know, live in, who are pretty young. They live in rented accommodation where everybody else is working at home as, as, as well. Um, and so, yeah, that was the, that was the sort of primary argument for this. Um, I I do think that you know, longer term, a lot of our learning systems are are not fully mobile, you know, compliant or responsive. Um, and it was something that we will have to look at quite carefully. But um, when you plan to design an online course, you think very very carefully about the audience that it is for during the design phase. That very much affects. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Anything quick for you? Well, that, that, that's exactly it, really. That that's covered it perfectly. It's essentially you have to design for that. You have to design simple to access materials which make sense. Don't take a huge amount of bandwidth or data. What we are seeing is governments around the world actually finding ways. So, I had a fantastic example of a school in Mumbai whose school just bought all the teachers' extra data because all they had was smartphones. They then designed all these great courses and and just not through not through planning, but actually as the outcome was all of their materials were mobile first immediately. And that makes these things so much more effective. It's about allowing every learner. There's so many devices, so many different connections around the world. And that's precisely what we've all been talking about. So it's, what can we do to help everyone to the best possible way? I've got one crazy example just from my previous institution, actually. We worked um, worked on a, a particular educational project in West Africa where somebody managed to get Google to um, provide internet connectivity with a balloon. Don't ask me how don't ask me how it worked, but it was it was incredible, extraordinarily innovative. I don't know if they still do things like that. It was, it was it really was, costly it as well, wasn't balloon. it? Inflation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd love to wrap it up on that joke. I was going to, however, let everyone try and have a final word answering Terry's question, which is, what do you think the new normal will be once the pandemic is over in terms of classroom and self-study time? So just a, a couple of 
you know, brief thoughts from everybody on what is the new normal going to look like? I can't believe I said the new normal, but anyway, uh, who would like to go first? Nick? Oh, <laughs> wow. Um, like I said, I think putting the AWS lens on it, I think for us, it's about this has made a step forward for all of us. Everyone's had to pivot and, and react. I think the exciting thing for us is this has allowed everything to carry on. I think the exciting thing from our side is that um, is all the things you can do once you've sort of gone on that cloud journey, terrible term, but, but all the really exciting stuff follows that first move. And what we're seeing with UCL and, and, and many others is that they're starting to make those other more exciting um, changes and services that using things like AI and ML. So that's, that's, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, that does. Thank you. Andrew? Um, well, briefly, we, we can't waste time talking about the new normal. It's now, so let's get on with it. What can we do? And people like Terry, if it's the Terry I think it is, has asked the question, get on with things and deliver these things. So it's about making best endeavours, doing the best we can. And that's the way we can make a difference. Great. Um, Joey, I'm going to come to you. Sorry, but Joey, I think you've already answered this yourself. So Joey, final thoughts from you. Yeah, I mean, as Andrew said, the new normal is now. It's not going to go back. I think that it, when we when we think about uh, learning or the learning, you know, lifelong learning is key, but the, the heavy learning phase at the beginning of many of our lives is not just about absorbing information as subject. There are a lot of other connections, social um, and almost um, freedoms that you that you that you seek and that you take on new challenges, new experiences. So I hope that we go back out and we mix and that we carry on with um, all of that side of things, but ultimately these platforms and these technologies need to just plug in kind of ergonomically, kind of comfortably to that to that world, um, enabling us to you know keep making connections uh, as humans, um, but but effectively um, you know take on board knowledge and information um, and learning as it were. Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I have really enjoyed it, and I actually am feeling quite positive. As someone said, it's sort of very sort of yeah uplifting ideas on how we can move forward and learn from what has been a difficult period for everyone I know and well done to all the teachers who've kept up with it all and for you guys for inspiring them too thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you at the next webinar soon take care thank you